Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us as we hear from Cisco in transitioning to the cloud. I wanted to walk through some of the options on your screen to help you guys have the best uh, experience this, uh, this Wednesday. And um, if you would like to speak to other audience members in the chat or engage with us, go ahead and click the icon. It is the second from the right on your screen. That'll open your group chat. If you have a question, hover over the Q&A box, click that, and you'll be able to ask the presenters directly. And then if you would like to leverage some of the resources that Cisco has provided for you today, those are in the resource list, and you should see three PDF icons available for your download. Uh, but without further ado, I will pass it off to our Cisco team, and I will pass it to Mike. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Moore, Practice Development Manager here at Insight from our Network and Integrated Security Practice. Thank you for taking the time to join us today on transitioning to the cloud, uh, an approach with SASE. So um, I have the pleasure to, to get us all kicked off. Um, welcome, everybody, again. Thanks for coming. Uh, we've got Eddie Mendonca from our Cisco team, who's a technical services architect or solutions architect, joining us from Cisco, who's going to go over Cisco Umbrella and the uh, Secure Access Services Edge framework from Cisco perspective. And then we have Amr Body, who's a partner solutions architect, who's going to cover the Meraki side of the house, along with integrations into the SD-WAN portfolio. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and wrap everything up at the end. So I'll go ahead and kick us off with network and security transformation. Um, as we see it through Insight within our cloud and data center transformation practice um, in, in the network and integrated security space. So we're going to be covering a lot of different use cases today that Eddie and Amr are going to go into. Um, but some of, one of the big use cases and one of the challenges that we see as we're looking at adopting SASE is really that the edge of our enterprise is no longer well-defined. If we think about the traditional model and how we traditionally consumed applications and resources, it was very centralized. We had a lot of stuff in our private data centers, the private cloud, but we're starting to see more things transition to public cloud. We have more work from home. So really that edge of the enterprise is pretty much everywhere, wherever our users are, the devices and things that are connecting to our workloads and applications. And we need to be able to secure that and provide optimal connectivity. And that, that centralized method of having a firewall back at the data center, the corporate headquarters, and backhauling all that traffic out to a huge uh, pipe to the internet egress and even bringing those VPN users to that same central point and hairpinning them back out is ultimately ineffective. So we're, we're looking for modern solutions that are going to give us the agility and give us the flexibility to provide the best experiences for our users, devices, and things regardless of where they sit um, out in the, the workplace. So as we look at adoption of SASE, um, really, 2018 is when it started to start to develop. The, the cloud security solutions started merging. We're seeing some consolidation. Around 2019, I think the term Secure Access Service Edge was uh, coined um, or, or SASE. And then from then, I mean, it's exploded from 1%. We're looking at 40% uh, adoption of strategies to implement SASE in environments by 2024. And I saw a report yesterday that by 2026, we're looking at 60%. So really, we're in that primary majority. Uh, early adopters, early majority, um, bringing these types of solutions into their environment. And one of the big um, focal points that kind of brought this to light was the fact that in the past year and a half, the work from home has just exploded. So a lot of the conversations we're having around SASE with our clients is for that remote worker connectivity use case. Um, and as we have those conversations, they, they start expanding the different things that we can leverage it for. And we'll get into that in a little bit here. Um, now, I've said Secure Access Service Edge and SASE probably 20, 30 times already. Some of you may be sitting out there, yeah, I heard of it. What exactly is it? Well, this is SASE in a nutshell. So ultimately, the, the simplest form, it's just the convergence of networking and network security solutions. So from a networking side, how can we provide all the flexibility and agility in our networking solutions, our WAN infrastructure to provide optimized experiences to the cloud? Uh, a lot of clients that we work with are looking at software-defined WAN as they're going to more modern WAN architecture solutions so they can gain that transport independence, better application performance, and uh, leverage things like direct Internet access to get us to our applications and our, our workloads um, more effectively than having to use that backhaul method that I, that I spoke of earlier. Now, from the security component, SD-WAN has always been a little challenging to secure. Do we put a firewall at each location if we want to do DIA? Do we use integrated security features in the SD-WAN solutions? 
do we keep backhauling to a centralized location, which ultimately de defeats the purpose of going SD-WAN? Um, and that's where SASE and cloud security have really enabled us to start getting the most out of those technologies, so more of a, a better together story. So SD-WAN being a component of SASE, where SASE um, is going to be the security framework, but also optimizing how we connect remote users as well as branch new users to our cloud resources, where SD-WAN is more optimizing the internal branch-to-branch -branch communications, branch-to-data center, but also direct internet access and then handing to a, a SASE or cloud security provider to provide that direct connectivity into our cloud services. Um, so there's a ton of technologies in the middle. Eddie and Amr are going to hit on a bunch of those, so I won't go too deep there. Um, but when we're having these conversations and really all networking and security, not just SASE, um, these are three really relevant conversations that we're having with the clients that we're talking to today. So securing the environment is always top of mind. We see ransomware in the news. Uh, there's new attacks and breaches being developed every day. So how do we know that our organization is safe and secure? How are we meeting all the check boxes that we have for compliance needs within our organization, whether uh, you're in financial, distribution, manufacturing, healthcare, et cetera? I mean, we all have different needs, so everything's going to be a little bit different. And how do we consolidate and um, bring those technologies into something that's a little more simpler to consume that's going to give us more capabilities. And that's where the conversation of paying off technical debt uh, really comes into play. So replacing end of support, end of life, legacy architectures where maybe the, uh, the complexities of maintaining and managing the solutions have far surpassed the capabilities that we're actually getting from them. So not just the end of life end of support conversation, but when we're paying off technical debt to introduce automation into our environments to streamline operations. And that's where we can leverage uh, the SASE framework to help consolidate some of these architectures and hopefully get some cost savings from that by reducing the hardware and software footprints that we have in our environment. And then the last piece, enabling the hybrid workforce. And I touched on that before. I mean, the past year and a half, we saw a huge explosion and a large, large adoption of SASE just to meet that use case, but as we get that into customer environments, they're seeing the benefits of paying off some of that technical debt, lowering that footprint they have in their environment, and then getting the, the security they need from a flexible cloud-delivered solution. So where we can help from a, a journey perspective as you're looking at adopting SASE, really we can start with the vision. We can help you figure out what that strategy looks like, where the different platforms and technologies that you have in your environment may be able to be consolidated and replaced by a, a cloud security or SASE type solution. But we also have the consulting and professional services team to help you get those executed into your environment in a timely manner so you can start leveraging the capabilities of those platforms. And then ultimately with the agility for business transformation, which is more on the operation side of the house. So integrating into existing monitoring tools or getting new ones in place for you or tying into SIM or your SOC or if if that's something you typically outsource or use managed services for, we have a managed stock that can consume all these logs from Cisco Umbrella and the Cisco infrastructure to do that piece for you. Um, this is really just a deeper dive into those three different buckets. I'm not going to drain this whole slide. It's kind of an eye chart, but today we're really talking about network security. But when we talk SASE, it really touches a bunch of these other components. I've already talked about software defined WAN, but it can go into traditional networking, segmentation, analytics infrastructure automation, and the list goes on and on and on. It, it goes back to that conversation of eliminating the technical debt and getting a uh, integrated architecture that's going to help condense some of the, the architectures that you have out in your environment. The last thing I'll leave you with before I hand it over to Eddie and we can get into some of the technical aspects and expand on the use cases is that we here at Insight, and we've seen this through Cisco as well, that the future of networking is really rooted in simplicity. We need to get rid of the complexity in the architectures. We need to be able to streamline our operations, and we need to have flexibility in how we consume these technologies. So we have as-a-service models out there now that are, we're able to, to consume. It's as-a-service. It's in the cloud. Um, so we can scale up or we can scale down fairly flexibly. And as we've seen with IT, um, it's really transitioned from supporting the business to driving the business. So having these streamlined architectures that change the way that we can interact with our customers through digital presence, our applications, e-commerce, 
Um, that's really the heart of the business. So we, we help those businesses run smarter, and it's through these simple technologies and, and with Insight Services and the solutions by Cisco. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and hand over to Eddie, and he's going to dive into the SASE framework from the Cisco umbrella perspective. Eddie, it's all yours. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, my name is Eddie Mendonca. I'm a security technical solutions architect at Cisco. Been with Cisco quite a while now, coming on 21 years, um, and uh, most of that time in, in software development uh, moved to this uh, systems engineering role uh, a few years ago and been covering Insight as the security architect from Cisco for uh, a few years now. So again, uh, a good morning, a good afternoon, depending on your on your time zone. We're going to do a little digging into the security aspects of SASE, um, uh, as well as the overall architecture. Um, and then I'm going to pass it over to, to Amr to cover uh, more uh, details on the networking um, the, the networking portions of SASE. Uh, so with that, I do have a couple slides that might be a little bit of overlap as to what, uh, as to what Mike covered around the, the, the problem statement and the challenges. Um, so again, this shouldn't be news to, to most of you, and that is that uh, our, our environment's changing. The landscape has, has changed quite a bit, not only in the last uh, year and a half because of COVID, but even before that. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, it goes without saying, uh, users are uh, just dispersed, um, they're connecting in different ways, um, and uh, they, they need seamless uh, um, access to any application wherever that application is hosted. So this, this shift in landscape uh, really lends itself to this, uh, this notion of a, a perimeter uh, evolving. Uh, that's one way to put it. Uh, perhaps disappearing is another way to put it. You might remember uh, years ago, uh, Cisco had this uh, uh, marketing campaign called the, the borderless network, right? I mean, that was probably 10 years ago we talked about borderless networking. Um, uh, it's really been exasperated with cloud adoption, right? So um, if I were to pick three of the most important um, uh, uh, items on this slide, it would be the fact that the users are remote now for the most part. Um, COVID has, um, uh, ha has made that very apparent, uh, uh, but even before that, a lot of people uh, worked remotely. Um, personal devices, right? You have users that want to use their personal devices on the network, on the corporate network. Um, how do you allow that? And then the third, I would say, uh, would be the, the, the migration of applications from on-premise to the cloud, right? So uh, it used to be that um, um, all of your um, internal apps were, were internal, like all, all of your purchasing, um, all, all of your back office stuff, accounting. Well, now it's, it's reversed. Uh, there's very few uh, internal apps now. Even uh, within Cisco's corporate network, again, I've been in Cisco quite a long time, it used to be that you had to be on VPN to do anything productive. Now, uh, I could go uh, weeks without getting on VPN and be completely productive. Um, there might be one or two back office applications, like the other day I was using a, um, the shipping tool that have to go in and put the information in to ship something to somebody. Um, that wasn't quite facing the, the public Internet yet. That needed a VPN in. Uh, but uh, you, you might draw similar um, comparisons with your own network where most of the, the, um, the CRMs and these other, these other uh, um, applications that are used daily are cloud hosted. So there's really no need to um, hairpin that traffic or funnel that tra traffic through the corporate office. So, so the perimeter that we're talking about now really is the user combined with the device. It's no longer a corporate network. Yes, we still have corporate networks for certain um, for certain things. We're still going to have IoT devices. We're just still going to have users go into the office. But for the most part, the work that needs to be done should be able to be achieved um, anywhere. So let's dig in a little more. Okay, so I think Mike covered this. So um, you know, the before and after. Uh, I think this uh, the, the concepts that are described on this slide have already been stated, and that is that um, we no longer need to, to tunnel all our traffic through corporate. We need an efficient way 
um, in a secure way to be able to allow uh, remote users and branch offices to go directly to the internet. So how are we going to do that? Well, that's introducing. Let's introduce SASE. So, um, Secure Access Services Edge. The, the the term was coined by Gartner a few years ago, uh, and it basically states that um, you should be able to uh, provide networking services and security services combined through the public internet. Okay, so uh, whether you're a remote access user or perhaps a branch office. Um, you should have the same security capabilities that you had at the corpus uh, or a branch office tunneled through the corporate network. You should be able to have those um, with direct Internet access. And that's what the, um, the major components of SASE are. All right. So um, – at Cisco, as you know, we've been around quite a while, uh, and we've done networking quite a while, and a lot of people don't realize this, but we've been in the security business quite a while as well. In fact, to the tune of 100% of Fortune 100 companies have some Cisco security component, okay? Um, networking, uh, as far as uh, software-defined WAN, we are the undisputed largest service provider for software-defined LAN. Um, and in the last couple years with our acquisition of Duo, we are the leader in zero trust, okay? Um, so uh, with th this, uh, uh, these technologies um, and uh, this, th uh, this infrastructure as a background, we're able, in our opinion, to provide the strongest SASE solution. So let's dig a little bit um, into the use cases and the technology behind these use cases. So we like to split up the SASE use cases into two major buckets. One is the secure remote worker. So this would be a, um, uh, a re remote worker working from home or perhaps um, a public location, but point being all they have is their endpoint and they're connecting directly to their application, okay? Um, I'm going to dig more into the details of the, the technology components with that uh, in a few slides, but for the purpose of what we're sharing now, we just want to separate these out. The next would be uh, your branch office, so your, your SD-WAN fabric. Um, Almer is going to spend a little more time on that, uh, but as far as a, 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 um, a, a security stack is concerned, uh, as I step through these components, understand that they work the same. Whether you're a, a remote worker or connect to a branch, uh, the security is still provided with do an umbrella, which is cloud delivered. All right, so before we dig into the technology, let's speak to a little bit of the challenges around remote workers. Um, if I were to, to, um, uh, to pick a few of the major challenges, it's going to be around the fact that Users don't like to have to VPN in. If you're, a, um, if you're a systems engineer or perhaps in operations and you have a home network and you have a home lab, what happens when you VPN in? You lose access to all that, right? So, so your, your, your IP address becomes a corporate IP address. You can't reach anything else in your, in, on your home network. Printing won't work if you're doing network print. Those kinds of things lend people to, uh, to say, forget it. I'm not going to VPN in. I'm going to try to get everything done that I need to do uh, on my own network and, and just go directly to Salesforce or whatever uh, cloud apps your, 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 your company uses, right? So that's the biggest challenge. So how do we provide security, um, um, at the same level of security that we had within the confines of a corporate network to the remote user? So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the other challenges I don't think we need to dr drill uh, down too much into, but things around identifying, um, you know, uh, uh, AAA needs, if you will, uh, authentication, authorization, and accounting, network access, visibility, those kinds of things are also challenging when you have remote uh, workers. So let's dig a little into the capabilities of, of, uh, of SASE. So we split them up into these three buckets, and that is how we connect our user. Um, in the secure um, use case, we can control them, how, how we can add these security capabilities. And on the far, far right here, how we converge with other, infra, uh, with other ecosystems, either within Cisco with our SecureX platform or perhaps even outside of Cisco. And, and we, um, uh, at Cisco, we have a, a large set of ecosystem partners. You can look it up, just Google 
um, Cisco Cybersecurity Alliance, and you'll see uh, tens or hundreds of, uh, of ecosystem partners that we deal with. Uh, okay, now circling back. So we are going to uh, spend a little time digging into the technical specifics here of how this stuff works. Maybe not on this slide, but understand at this level um, that we have Cisco Umbrella, which is our cloud-delivered infrastructure that supports DNS, secure internet gateway, web proxy, cloud-delivered firewall. It is basically our cloud-delivered security stack. Okay. On top of that, we also have, um, with the acquisition of Duo, we're able to check posture on apps, um, provide uh, multi-factor authentication, uh, reverse proxy, for uh, substitute for VPN, lots of different capabilities there around Duo, um, and that actually, the, the Duo um, acquisition actually puts us as a leader in, in Zero Trust as well. Any Connect you might be familiar with, that's our, our VPN client. Well, in the last, uh, I would say, four to five years, we've actually added a lot of other agents to Any Connect. So you have one agent that you can install that, um, uh, th that provides for endpoint capabilities for all these other things. Uh, that uh, um, um, that we're using with SASE. Uh, control, well, again, we're going to dig a little more into that on a future slide, uh, but point being is that all of this you can manage directly in the cloud. So you, you don't have to stack appliances on-prem or in your branch office for this stuff. All you do is just make some configuration changes and then point your browser to the umbrella cloud and you're off and running creating policy. All right, so now we're going to dig a little into the capabilities of Umbrella. So Umbrella, if you're not familiar with that, is the open DNS acquisition that occurred, oh, I don't know, uh, maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, so when that product first got acquired by Cisco and folded into the security stack, it was a DNS layer only security product. So what does that mean? That means that to use uh, open DNS or Umbrella, all you do is just change your uh, recursive DNS forwarding to go to Umbrella instead of your ISP, and then all of a sudden you get all these security capabilities built in. So if you were to click or perhaps type in uh, a domain that was already convicted as a malicious domain, instead of the DNS resolver returning that IP address and your local browser pointing it to that malicious infrastructure, you'd get redirected to um, a block page that say, hey, you don't want to go here. And so that's, in a nutshell, how DNS layer security works. And if you think about that, you think, well, that, that's not tied at all to my, um, my browser or HTTP or any um, uh, layer four or layer uh, uh, seven protocol. That's actually just DNS. So you, then, then you realize this works for everything. You don't, it, it's not just like a web proxy. It, it works for all traffic. Um, so that's really the, the power with, with, uh, um, uh, with the DNS layer security that we have is that it doesn't really matter what app you're using. Everything uses DNS. Okay, so that was the initial um, uh, product uh, offering with, uh, with Umbrella, with, with, with OpenDNS. Since then, you can see we've migrated quite a few other technologies on top of Umbrella, namely uh, a web proxy. So what you're traditionally used to with Cisco's WSA, or Web Security Appliance, has been migrated into Umbrella. Um, Cloud-delivered firewall. So uh, think of a traditional ASA being deployed out in the public cloud. That has been migrated to Umbrella. So you could do like layer three and four um, traditional firewalling, as well as layer seven, as well as being able to let the platform detect applications and that kind of thing. Uh, CASB, Cloud Access Security Broker, being able to provide provide um, data loss protection and create policies around cloud app usage. We're able to do that now with Umbrella. And in red, you see the, the ro remote browser isolation and data loss prevention. We, we recently added those as well, in, all into Cisco Umbrella. So what that means is that you have this one management platform that you can configure your policy, um, and as long as your on-prem infrastructure or, your, or your, if you're uh, remote, um, browser use case. Um, as long as your browser and your and your endpoint is pointing uh, to the infrastructure, it's protected. Okay. On the far right, you see SecureX. That's um, Cisco's new platform uh, for integrating all these various components together and having a centralized 
console, not just Cisco, but non-Cisco as well. All right. Um, I spent a lot of time describing how Umbrella works uh, from the DNS layer. Uh, so this slide is really more um, uh, to, 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 uh, 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 to highlight the fact that it is a great first line of defense. So DNS security is a great first line of defense. Um, all you have to do is point your resolver to the Umbrella DNS servers, then go into the Umbrella console to find some basic policy, and even the default policy will work to block malware, and that's it. So it's a great um, first line of defense against uh, command and control callbacks, phishing, malware, all that stuff you get in Heritage Block. And on top of that, you could use this to do other more um, granular things like content filtering. You don't want to disallow whatever it is, gambling or social networking certain hours of the day. You could do that uh, with Umbrella. Okay. Now, this slide, we're going to dig a little more into the capabilities of Umbrella past the DNS layer protection. Um, I've mentioned some of these already, but now's a good time to, um, to maybe drill a little deeper. How do we do the visibility and protection and control? Um, well, it, it, when, we, when we migrated some of those other features from other products like the WSA and the Cloud Lock Hasby into Umbrella, we're able to provide provide things like SSL decryption because now we're a proxy. Uh, we're able to see the visibility of all the apps, um, all the web traffic. We're able to block things like shadow IT now with the CASB capabilities. Okay? Protection, web inspection, file inspection, all this stuff is built in. It's a full service firewall, a next generation firewall, if you will, that's in the cloud. Okay? So for some of these things, like if you're just doing DNS layer security, you don't need to create any kind of network tunnels or uh, pack files or any, any of that stuff. It's just DNS. But for other things, like if you want to do the web inspection, file inspection, or you want the cloud-delivered firewall, then you would go in and, and create the, those tunnels or use a pack file for if you're doing just web filtering. I think Amr might cover more of that when he covers the, uh, the SD-WAN and the networking portion of, the, of this presentation. Uh, for control, um, if, if I had uh, time, I would show you a demo. It probably does a better job of describing this. But you can go into the Umbrella UI and go in and, and create uh, very specific rules. You can do whitelisting, blacklisting. You could do granular app control, um, content filtering, tenant control. What is that? That is where, let's say you're an Office 365 user. Your, your company uses Office 365, but you want to disallow your users from binding to other, like, personal O365 tenants. You can do that with tenant control. Okay? Same thing with G Suite or these other, um, uh, these other cloud platforms that have the notion of a tenant. Okay? Uh, DNS layer security, uh, it's important to call out. The reason why we left this slide in is that what if you have a domain that is neither clean nor malicious? Let me give you an example, uh, Reddit. Okay? So, uh, 90%, maybe even 95% of the, the traffic that's going through Reddit is perfectly safe, right? Uh, but there are some uh, domains, not domains, that's the wrong, there are some URLs within Reddit that, um, that can be considered suspect, uh, to say the least, right? So if you want to block certain traffic within a domain, uh, then you need more than DNS layer security. And that's what the arrow in the middle shows, is that we could, um, in certain circumstances, filter the traffic uh, through our web proxy only if it's suspect, only if we need to. And that uh, lends itself to a much more efficient architecture, right? You don't have to filter everything. That's extremely inefficient if you're familiar with web proxies and how they work. You don't want to have to filter everything. Instead, use DNS layer security. Okay, good domain. You know these domains are good or you know these domains are bad. There's no need to proxy them. Uh, something that, that might need to be proxied can be. Okay, so I, I think I've covered this already. So with, with the, the, the full web proxy, we're able to do um, very granular URL logging and visibility. We're able to do SSL decryption and inspection. Um, uh, we're able to enforce acceptable use policies. Again, we're filtering the traffic. You get that, you get that same uh, um, granular feature set that you would with a full-blown web proxy. 
all right, how about some metrics? Uh, you know, OpenDNS, before it was acquired by Cisco, was a very popular um, uh, de- de- um, protection for, for home users. I was using it even before the acquisition. Um, we had hundreds of millions of users even before the acquisition, um, and, and we added all these capabilities uh, to that Uh, To that point, we have over 600 billion with a B requests a day coming through the umbrella network. Okay, hundred over 100 million active users, uh, um, 25, 24,000 enterprise customers, and we're in 160 countries. Okay. Um, Oh, cool. The animation actually works. I kind of spoke to this already, uh, but that is the fact that um, uh, that. We're able, actually, no, this, I thought this was a slide that, that was describing, uh, describing the intelligent proxy. It's not. Uh, what we're, what we're uh, describing here is our threat intel. Um, so if you're familiar with uh, our threat intelligence organization, uh, we've said this for years now, we have the largest threat intelligence organization outside of any government entity. Okay, so it's called Cisco Talos. You could use it um, even, you can research the blog post, you can get a lot of threat intel, even without purchasing any Cisco gear. If you, if you have a Cisco gear, the, the, the thread feed's automatic. Uh, but um, Cisco Umbrella leverages this threat intelligence. Not only Talos, but other uh, like algorithmic stuff and AI and spike rank model, these kinds of things. We need to be able to do this stuff automated. It isn't just a, a bunch of researchers that uh, are, are, uh, are, are clicking um, and, and determining whether these domains are malicious um, real time. This is um, a lot of back-end infrastructure and automation that goes into this. Uh, speaking a little to the f- efficacy, and I think I have a slide that mentions an award that we won uh, not too long ago. Um, when you have as much telemetry as Cisco does, you're able to um, you, you, you're able to claim great efficacy because you do have that hard, that large data set. Okay, so think of um, even outside of the security space. Think of uh, email users and networking users uh, that, that have leveraged Cisco technology for all these years. Uh, we're able to draw on that telemetry um, and um, honing it back to Umbrella. Um, we do have um, over 3 million new domains that we discover um, daily. Um, identifying over 60K uh, malicious destinations um, and enforcing those, the, the malicious URLs. I think that's the, the biggest value with Umbrella is that you don't have to define any policy. You just need to turn it on, and you're, blo- and, and you're, de- you're protected against all the malicious domain infrastructure. Um, around the, the accolades, we did w- win the AV test, uh, took first place in uh, threat detection. Um, I don't see a link referencing uh, the award on the slide, but um, you could reach out in the chat and we can point you to that, um, that where Cisco Umbrella beat all the other cloud-delivered uh, firewall competitors in um, providing the best threat detection. As far as setting this up, again, I, sp- I spoke to this already. Um, if you're just using uh, the DNS layer protection, this is all you have to do. Sign up. Uh, reach out to Insight. They'll, they, they have access to the Cisco Umbrella uh, portal. The, they'll be able to issue a trial very easily. Point your DNS to the Umbrella infrastructure, and you're done. Okay? You don't even need to create a policy. The default policy protects you against malicious domains. Okay? Yes, you'll probably want to go in and create a policy and do other things, like customize your block page and, and, and create some content filtering. Uh, but the point being is that for this, the, the, that first line of defense, the easy button, it's very easy. All you do is just sign up, point your DNS, and you're, and you're off and running. Uh, I, I think I've, I, I've mentioned uh, most of these things already, and that is that Cisco Umbrella, the open DNS acquisition, started out as DNS layer security. Since then, we've added a full-blown web proxy. We've added the cloud-delivered firewall and much of the components from CloudLock, which is our CASB acquisition from a few years ago, um, and increased the, um, the, the amount of threat intel that we're pulling in. All right, it's very simple to get a proof of value up and running. All you have to do is just reach out to your Insight account manager and and they will get it going for you. Um, uh, For DNS, all we do is 
point your DNS server um, um, to the umbrella infrastructure. It's very uh, non-disruptive. I know when Cisco corporate uh, uh, acquired OpenDNS, within a few months we moved to using it. And uh, I remember the article came out uh, within the corporate um, intranet describing the migration, and it took under 20 minutes. For, and at the time, I and mean, this was 2007, something like that, um, there was over 50,000 users on the Cisco corporate network. So very lightweight migration. Um, what we see, these numbers in red you see on the right, these are um, from the, the, uh, the proof of values that we've run with various customers. We see these percentages of, of uh, ransomware or exploit kits or, or Trojans found. Um, so very effective on blocking these things. And I believe that is my last slide. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Amir to cover more of the Meraki and SD-WAN portions of SASE. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Eddie. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amir Batty. I'm a Mark, uh, Meraki Partner Solutions Architect. And as Mike and Eddie mentioned earlier, I be, I'll be spending the next few minutes to talk about SASE from a Cisco Meraki perspective. So as you guys have probably heard, you know, we have to keep in mind that SASE is really a journey for many organizations, not a destination. Everyone's in a different phase of this journey. At Meraki, our SASE vision is really to provide the best of in-class security experience for any workload for, from anywhere, you know, whether you're, you have a teleworker, user sitting at home or you have a user sitting in the branch office or someone sitting in HQ or in a data center. Uh, we have done this in a very simply uh, simplified manner. And as I'm sure some of you guys who are familiar with Meraki have already seen uh, the Meraki simplicity factor. So this just really ties in uh, together quite nicely. And as I start talking about it, you'll get a, a really good understanding of the different types of components that build the SASE uh, solution when it comes to Meraki. So as Eddie mentioned before, you know, Meraki follows the same three SCs that were discussed earlier, connect, control, and converge when it comes to delivering SASE. We're going to take a look at each one of these Cs uh, in the next few slides and really understand exactly how Meraki accomplishes that. So starting with the connect portion, right? We're able to do this by providing a high quality of experience with Meraki's SD-WAN. And looking deeper into this, there's three big uh, capa uh, key capabilities that we have to look at. The first is advanced analytics with machine learning, SD-WAN connectivity, and then integrated agile solution, uh, security. With advanced analytics and uh, with machine learning, you get the full platform-wide visibility. You also get detailed insights into the SaaS applications that those users are connecting to. You get a really good understanding of your WAN health connections across all of the different networks within an organization. So you know exactly how a specific VAN link is performing in one location versus another. For a SD-WAN connectivity uh, perspective, there are you know, a lot of different uh, cloud providers available today, a lot of workloads that have shifted into the cloud. So being able to really extend the SD-WAN fabric when it comes to Meraki to incorporate all of these multi-cloud uh, providers so that way any user that is sitting really from anywhere in the world can connect and access these resources, leveraging SD-WAN and the best of class experience. And then finally, uh, with integrated agile security, it's all about really tying in to all the great security solutions that Cisco has that Eddie mentioned, uh, mentioned such as Cisco Umbrella, Cisco Talos, and bringing them into the Meraki solution so that way you can have the best of experience uh, when it comes to being protected from day zero threats. So looking at the visibility piece, really understanding that unique end-to-end -end platform visibility. What you're looking at right now is just an example of the type of visibility that you can get when you have multiple different Meraki products in your environment. 
So whether you have a MR wireless access point, a MS switch, a MX security and SD WAN appliance, you know, if you have a client that is sitting behind any of these Meraki products, once they are accessing certain types of resources, Meraki is able to provide you with very detailed insights as to which applications they're accessing, uh, if there's any performance related issues internal to the network, or if there's any issues external, like on a SaaS provider side. So that way you get a really good understanding as to the health of the network itself. And we can do this across all of the networks within an organization very seamlessly and easily. What this really allows us to do is really slash that mean time to resolution. So anytime a user comes up to you and complains that my you know, Salesforce or Microsoft Office 365 is not working, you're able to very quickly and easily understand exactly where the issue lies and then go ahead and remediate that problem so that way your users can be up and running with as minimal uh, downtime as possible. So like I mentioned before, there's three uh, key things such as web app health, WAN health, and VoIP health. With web app health, you essentially get you know, your LAN visibility, WAN visibility, and the application server visibility as that user is accessing that specific you know, web application. You're able to get sub-second information really drill down to exactly what, for example, a HTTP response time is, or what server on the SaaS provider side that user is connecting to, and really remediate those you know, uh, latency uh, issues that sometimes can occur. On the WAN health side, like I mentioned before, just having that single pane of glass visibility up, uh, into your WAN ports and WAN connections uh, across all of your different networks. So you know exactly which WAN link is not performing as well as the others, and you can pinpoint and isolate some of those issues to help uh, bring you back up or just really fix those issues with those service providers. And finally, with VoIP Health, it's all about being able to track that voice traffic, right? Being able to understand exactly how that voice traffic is performing. If somebody is in a meeting and they're not getting the best performance possible, then being able to really help them understand exactly what's going on and uh, solve for that issue on a hop by hop basis. Just one of the great things that Meraki does uh, when it comes to our products and our solutions is that we Without additional costs, we provide constant updates to the feature sets and introduce new features. One of those specifically is uh, what we call smart thresholds. And what this really does is it eliminates the need of you know, setting any thresholds that would be triggered if there is some sort of anomaly that occurs. Right? Anytime, let's say, a specific server uh, wasn't performing well, then, you know, this would really help identify that issue. Previously, we were able to allow you to go ahead and do this manually, and we still can, but now we made it easier. With just a toggle of a switch, now you can go ahead and just enable smart thresholds, which really automatically, based on per previous performance, workloads, historical data, allows users to automatically get the best um, understanding of what a true anomaly is. If you're getting false positives, you know, those things are things that can be avoided. So being able to just understand exactly how a specific a web app, for example, is performing and being able to very quickly and easily remediate those issues is what this really uh, Smart Thresholds provides. And we've gone ahead and, you know, probably the most simplest and easiest IPsec site-to-site -site VPN tunnels that you can ever create in the industry, which is our Meraki's auto VPN technology. In just three clicks, you're able to go ahead and create these site-to-site -site tunnels from one MX to another. 
So being able to extend your SD-WAN fabric, being able to connect different sites together with just MXs on both ends, it's the most simplified and most secure uh, experience that you can have. It automatically configures all the VPN parameters, has redundancy built right in, and gives you the options to really select how you want that traffic going out. So that way you can go ahead and either just do, for example, dynamic pass selection or being able to really prioritize traffic across one link over the other. As an example, um, and kind of deep, getting a little bit deeper into this, you know, being able to express your intent, for example, defining performance thresholds that say that, you know, I want all my traffic to be sent out um, on WAN1 uplink for, you know, a specific SaaS application. But at the same time, if it exceeds these performance thresholds, then I want to go ahead and move my traffic over to WAN2 so that way I can get make ensure that my users get the best experience possible and can avoid these performance degradation. So we have built in uh, layer seven categories and applications. You can really get granular and specify how you want that traffic going out. And all of this is really delivered by our Meraki MX security and SD-WAN appliances. We've recently refreshed our MX product line, so we've introduced even more hardware um, products as well. Now we have different models that really cater to a lot of different types of use cases that we weren't able to really uh, cater to before. So we now offer you know, multi-WAN ready um, MX appliances. We have 3G, 4G, LTE, either built in or you can go ahead and connect an MG or Meraki gateway device to those uplinks to get that SD-WAN capability. You can even go ahead and leverage your LTE connections as part of SD-WAN now. As part of uh, the MX appliances, we offer you know, HA mode as well as uh, automatic WAN failover. And finally, for those smaller remote or branch offices, we offer additional models that provide those Ethernet ports with PoE or PoE plus options. So taking a look at our, the control piece, you know, Eddie went over this quite a bit, but we really bring in all that, all the great things that Cisco has to offer into Meraki and really integrate that nicely. So I'm not gonna dive uh, deep into this since Eddie meant, uh, went over this, but we have integration with Talos, right? So all the great thing, uh, products, uh, security products that Cisco has, such as Firepower, Umbrella, you know, all that is really backed up by Cisco Talos. We fully integrate with Cisco Talos. So whether it's on-prem, cloud, you know, Cisco, Meraki's SD-WAN, fully is powered by its Talos. So anytime there are threats, you know, when a Cisco Firepower ASA sees it, we see it as well, and we're updating our definitions all the time. So you're, you, you as a customer can be ensured that you have best of class security already in place anytime there is a, another vulnerability that is identified. We also here integrate with Cisco AMP, um, BrightCloud, um, Snort for IDS IPS, for example. So there's tons of integrations that are available. And of course, we have Cisco Umbrella as a really nice native integration, which I'll get to in a second. So let's take a look at how Meraki ties into Cisco Umbrella now. You've seen this slide before, and the only really difference is that Meraki is a part of this, right? So Meraki has this great integration with Cisco Umbrella. We're working really closely together, uh, and we've simplified all of this, right? We've simplified the deployment. We made it a lot easier for our customers to leverage all the great things that Cisco Umbrella has to offer. And at the same time, Meraki has an integration with SecureX. So it makes that management automation really simplified and provides really granular visibility. So there are two different things that you can do when it comes to Cisco Umbrella is, uh, and the integration with Meraki. 
The first is really getting that, you know, we've had this for a while, but that connectivity to Umbrella SIG. So being able to send uh, traffic um, that's critical or any other traffic that you identify to Umbrella SIG for inspection purposes. We've recently gone ahead, and this is limited availability, is we've extended the SD-WAN fabric to Umbrella SIG. So now you can go ahead and leverage all the great things that SD-WAN has to offer and leverage Umbrella uh, at the same time. So that way, again, the users now can leverage SD-WAN and be secure at the same time, no matter where they are in the world. So as just a recap, why SASE with Meraki? Well, as I mentioned before, right, there's different phases that every organization is going through. And just to kind of recap, right, when it comes to Meraki, in phase zero, we actually focused on more consolidating the networking and security stacks, which we did greatly. And moving forward, we, were, we went into phase one, which was bringing in that native integration with Umbrella and MX, so that way our customers can leverage all the great features that Umbrella has to offer, and at the same time, simplify it in terms of management of all of the Meraki devices. In limited availability now, we actually have phase two. So if any customer is interested, definitely work with Insight so that way they can get you guys signed up for this limited availability phase two, which brings that SD-WAN fabric to um, Umbrella SIG. Allows customers to, like I mentioned before, be able to leverage those SD-WAN capabilities so that, that way anytime a user is connecting, you're ensuring that traffic uh, is getting the best performance as possible. And in our phase three, which will be coming soon down the line, is we're going to make it even simpler. We're going to go ahead and provide as a service consumption model. Uh, we'll talk about that more when the time comes, but this is going to make everything that we've already simplified even more simpler. And finally, just to recap, uh, you know, it really, SASE with Meraki really helps putting you as a customer in the driver's seat. What that means is with Meraki, you get the proven platform that eases that transition to SASE, right? Not everyone's on the same phase. With Meraki, you can go ahead and really start moving towards that direction of being secure. We do have that best of class security integration like Eddie was mentioning before with Cisco Talos and ThreadGrid. And then we have the world's most trusted SD-WAN provider, right? We have combined, you know, Meraki and Victel combined, we have more than 30,000 customers. That's huge. There's a reason why we have so many customers and it's the largest amount of customers in the industry today. And then platform-wide visibility, like I showed you guys before, being able to really understand on a granular level exactly how traffic is being moved, if there's any issues at any of those certain hops, being able to have that visibility. Uh, recognized for reduced OPEX through simplicity. I'm sure if you guys have used Meraki or if you have not, definitely reach out to Insight to get a trial gear. Really see it for yourself. And then finally, open APIs. So that way, you as a customer can go ahead and leverage all the API endpoints we have available to automate, make your life even more easier than you had with just using the Meraki dashboard. And the great thing is you can integrate with Meraki, uh, with the API endpoints that Meraki provides with any of your third-party solutions like ServiceNow, for example. So with that, um, I'm going to pass it back to Mike to talk about, uh, to close this out, actually. Awesome. Thanks, Amr. So we've come full circle. We are on the home stretch. There's a couple slides left. Um, wanted to leave you guys with some resources out there that you can take away if you want to go a little bit deeper. I think we had a, a pretty good mix, hopefully, uh, from the, the use case side, the business use cases, as well as some technical information about the SASE portfolio. If you want to go deeper, though, um, definitely reach out. As Eddie mentioned, we, we have the Umbrella Partner Portal where we can help spin up POVs if you guys would like a demo on Umbrella or Meraki SD-WAN and the integrations. We are very happy to do that. 
Um, but just wanted to leave you with, um, as we're talking about the modern edge and intelligent edge and how we're that uh, perimeter around our environment is really dissolving and expanding to the endpoint. Um, we have a lot of content out there. We actually just did a conference and I'm gonna hit on it here in the next slide, but really goes into how we can leverage an intelligent edge to make that access more seamless. We've kind of seen that through the, uh, the use cases with SASE and SD-WAN today. How can we optimize that connectivity regardless of where those users sit and our applications sit, whether it's on-prem, private cloud, or public cloud? And then how do we make sure we're providing that high security assurance for all of those different services and all the users and uh, contractors, employees, and customers that we're, we're interfacing with on a daily basis? So highly encourage you to download the resources that are available in the ON24 platform. I think we have one up there around managed SD-WAN uh, zero Trust and SASE. Uh, that'll help go a little bit deeper on these solutions. Um, and then the insight.com slash accelerate. This is a whole library of digital conference that we put on around the intelligent edge. So it'll go from everywhere from Kubernetes to containers to compute at the edge to SD-WAN, SASE. Um, the one that I will selfishly plug is the network is the edge. I helped put that presentation together. We have director of the network and integrated security practice, Rob Parsons, presenting on that, and our director of professional services, Jeremy Nelson. Some really great information that'll take you a little bit deeper into the SASE and SD-WAN conversation, as well as uh, provide a reference architecture that goes into how we view that modern edge. Um, with that, I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Um, if there are any questions following this event, feel free to reach out to your Insight Count Exec. Uh, happy to, to expand on these conversations, but really appreciate everyone's time and have a great rest of the week.